Welcome to the First Things First podcast. And first things first, we need you to subscribe and leave comments, letting us know what you think of the show. We're listening. I'm Nick Wright, joined by two of my favorite people, Jenna Wolf, Chris Carter. Now let's get the show started. Oh, hey there, everyone, and welcome to First Things First. I'm Jenna Wolf. That is the Hall of Famer, Chris Carter. And that Risky is Nick show Wright. Today. Risky show. Are you worried? Are you I'm just worried letting about America something? know. My man Chris Carter was out till about one in the morning, getting shots up, playing that's, this, that's playing in this men's basketball league. I, my spies there said your team won despite your performance. You were frustrated with your jump shot, and you stuck around after to get some shots up. Didn't get in the house till about one in the morning. It's like five and a half hours ago, bro. Jenna, you look great today. <laughs> Thank you See? so I much, you, Chris show. Carter. I, I don't think it'll be a risky show. I think you got your A game. I think you played America, your A game, and you're going to no bring denial. your A game. There's no America, denial. America's in the freezer, so let's bring them a little heat <laughs> Okay, let's do it. I think that means let's start. I'm going to go ahead and interpret English to English. We're going to start with the much-hyped rematch between the Celtics and the Cavaliers. We knew going in, former Celtic and current Cav Isaiah Thomas would not play. We knew going in that former Cav and current Celtic Kyrie Irving would play. And we knew that this would be a great game. Clearly, we don't know everything. This one turned out to be a bit of a dud. Celtics beat a lackluster Cavs team, 102-88. LeBron just 19 points. Kyrie just 11 points. Not much better. So, CC, I'll ask you, did last night convince you that the Celtics compete with the – that they can compete with the, the Cleveland Cavs? Uh, yeah, if the NBA – if they go to some type of new format in the playoffs that I haven't seen where a team's going to play maybe five games in, in, in eight days – and then going to play a back-to-back, and then going to have to travel from the West Coast, go back to Cleveland, pick up a change of clothes, then go to Boston. If they do it like that, and then, then, Boston has a chance. And then the Celtics haven't played since New Year's Eve, hmm, I, I think that, yeah, absolutely. Like, it, if in that situation, given the NBA, a lot of times we look at these matchups, but maybe with Nick we need to look at, okay, what's the schedule before we got here? And maybe is there any difference, discrepancy in the amount of rest? Because that's what last night's game was. It was a classic NBA of a back-to-back. And you're talking about the ultimate advantage in the NBA is when you're on back-to-backs, let alone them coming from last week's West Coast trip. So it, it was about rest. Um, Boston, they, they, they looked okay. It was not a great basketball game. Um, I think they're getting more comfortable with who Cleveland has. But even with Isaiah Thomas playing the night before, not playing last night, this is not the Cleveland team that we're going to see. So I'm not surprised by the results. First quarter started off pretty intense. But for the Cavs, they looked like a tired basketball team. I was surprised by the result. I text you before the game. I'm like, hey, CeCe, what line you got on this game? I thought I saw the Cavs with three-point underdogs. I thought the Cavs would win the game outright. So I was surprised by it. You mentioned the back-to-backs. It's odd, but it's true. LeBron James in his career averages more points on the second night of a Mm back-to-back than he does on regular rest. It doesn't seem to usually – he's not a guy that seems to wear down. And early in the game, it didn't look like he was wearing down at all. He was 7 of 8 from the field to start. So I was surprised that the Celtics won and won convincingly the way they did. But does this change my opinion? (laughs) No. And it shouldn't change anyone's opinion. Whatever you thought going into last night's game, if you're in the Chris Mannix field, and I'm sure he'll join us sometime in the next few weeks, the Celtics are the favorite. Then good, you should, have, you should still feel that way. If you're in the correct field, that the Cavs are obviously the favorite, you should still feel that way. Let me, last night was the outlier of outlier performances. Maybe it was because of the discrepancy in rest, but here's what I know about last night. Last night, Terry Rozier... Marcus Smart, and a guy named Adam Thice, Daniel Thice, pardon me, combined to go 9 of 14 from three. Meanwhile, Kevin Love, Jay Crowder, and Dwayne Wade combined to go 5 of 33 from the field. If Kevin Love's going to have the worst game of his career, Jay Crowder's going to have his worst game of the season, Dwayne Wade's going to have his worst game in two months. At the same time, Terry Rozier has the best game of his career then guess what's going to happen? The Celtics are going to win despite Kyrie Irving playing poorly. Like, nothing that we saw last night 
is duplicable. So no, it's not going to change my opinion. Okay, I, I agree with you that last night was sort of a dud. But when I brought up a couple weeks ago that the Celtics were playing poor because they were just being hammered at the end of the year, back-to-back -back games, no rest in between games, I said, well, isn't there something to this? And maybe this is why their stretch is the way it is. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. I thought that what I got back was, hey, this is the schedule you're going to get. You kind of have to deal with it, and you get ups, and you end your play with it, which is why I fully understand what the Cavs are going through and why last night – Everyone just sort of had a, a dud of a well, game. Well, the Celtics, to respond to that, the Celtics, I think it was a more of a justification for a prolonged bad stretch of basketball as and opposed was, to one night. It was night. a correction the, the, it, to them playing great basketball. Like, we knew they couldn't shoot, continue to shoot like that. We knew that they couldn't continue to play defense like that. So... The NBA in the schedule made its correction, which we saw right. in the performance. And the Cavs are, have lost, what, four of their last five? Four, of si four, four or of five and maybe five of seven. Okay, so it's a smaller sample size. Mm -hmm. But perhaps what was happening to the Celtics with the fatigue is, could that possibly be catching sure. up to the Cavs a little sure. bit? Sure, all, all, all those things are in play. Yeah. But the, the point, the reason that I wasn't, as, as CeCe mentioned, that I was not going to simply attribute what was going on with the Celtics to the schedule was because it was a necessary correction. The Celtics were never going to finish the year mm -hmm. with the best record in the NBA. And the reason I'm not going to overreact to last night was because nothing I saw about last night seems to me to apply to a playoff series. Forget the fact that the Cavs' best, second best player was not playing in Isaiah Thomas. Just the fact that Kevin Love was terrible. Yeah. You take mm -hmm. out Kyle Korver, the Cavs who shoot more threes than any team in the league but Houston, they were 3 of 24 from 3. It was the worst offensive night the Cavs have had all year long, and you had some guys from the Celtics that are not big point scorers, yeah. Terry Rozier and Marcus Smart, no doubt. play out of their mind. All right, well, there was another story surrounding the Cavs last night. According to reports, the Cavs owner, Dan Gilbert, asked LeBron James if he'd commit to this Cleveland team long term, and James reportedly refused to answer the question. LeBron has the option to become a free agent at the end of the season. It's widely speculated he'll head to Los Angeles next year. CeCe, what do you make of LeBron's non-statement statement, if you will? This is normal for LeBron. I mean, he's done this four, four times at least. When you say done this, what, what do you mean? As far as not make a decision. His last year, the first time in Cleveland, they asked him this all, all year. He had the right to opt out of the contract. He did, which led to the, the decision which led into Miami for four years. In that four years there, he had the, the, he had the ability to leverage his contract. He did that. In the fourth year, he decided to leave, go back to Cleveland. He had the same approach. And in Cleveland, the didn't first he sign two years? He signed one-year one year deals, deals there. So this is the way LeBron is going to operate. No, I wasn't surprised. I didn't expect him to get him an answer. Dan Gilbert didn't expect an answer. LeBron... He doesn't know what's best for him at the first week in January compared to total free agency and where other players are going to go. IT, the second best player on the cab. This is last year of his contract. So why should LeBron make – what advantage does LeBron have by committing early to Cleveland compared to just waiting, which we've seen him do? And he's kind of orchestrated his career very brilliantly, you know, to recover – from the PR nightmare of the decision, going to Miami, getting two championships there, and bringing a championship back to Cleveland. So I like the way LeBron has handled his business. This is what I expected. I would have been shocked if there was any type of reply or answer or commitment either way that I was leaving. I mean, just imagine if LeBron wakes up this morning and he had told Dan Gilbert, I'm leaving. Well, if you said Dan Gilbert didn't expect an answer, why is Dan Gilbert even asking this, knowing this is what he LeBron does? He owns the team. Does? He's got to ask the question. Yeah, I mean, but, maybe there's the, the off chance that LeBron gives him a definitive answer, so there's no problem in asking it. But anyone acting as if LeBron did the wrong thing by not giving a commitment one way or another, what if LeBron didn't know? What if LeBron right now doesn't know? You mean if he pulls a Doug Peterson and no, tells the truth? No, no, no. I just mean, like, what if what if LeBron's asked before they try, trade Kyrie? Are you committed to the Cavs long term? And he really doesn't know. Well, my second best player seems to not be on the same page as me. Mm -hmm. We're going to get more into that later. Then they trade Kyrie. All right, well, now we, I, I don't know how I'm going to mesh with Isaiah Thomas. I don't know his health. I don't know what the situation is going to be like in Los Angeles or in Houston or anywhere else. Like, the... the, I, the I've been saying this for a while, and I mean it. I don't mean to be disrespectful to any of the NBA reporters out there. But there are a few people...
that have, that have claimed to report that they know what LeBron's going to do next season. I believe those people are either being lied to or are lying because I don't think LeBron knows. I think right now, if you were to, if you are LeBron's best friend, if you are Mav Carter or you're Rich Paul and you're having this conversation, yes. so what are we doing this offseason? Man, I don't know. If we win the title, mm -hmm. I'm almost assuredly staying. Yes. And I can it, validate, not through Mav, we both know Mav, but through the agent Paul, that LeBron doesn't know what he's going to do. In a recent meeting, that was discussed um, about some other type of business. It was brought up, and he said we really didn't know. When, when LeBron made the decision, when he was on that airplane flying, the people on the plane did not know where LeBron was going to sign. So for us to think the way he's navigated throughout his life and his career, he's the only person really to live up to the hype of a nickname like the King, I'm going to trust his decision making, and this is very similar to the other ways he's made the decision. And when you have leverage and power in a situation, why would you ever make a decision before oh, you no, have everyone all else, the... Everyone else always does that, Nick. But, but, like with their career and everything, they, they always, oh, yeah, I would have given the guy. When you got leverage, you better maintain that leverage. And you want to get all the available information. Why would you ever make a decision, a career life-changing decision, without all the available information to you. Some guys commit long-term early because of the financial security of it, because they want to they, they want to be able to entice other guys to play with them. LeBron's going to LeBron's financially secure and going to be able to entice guys to play with him no matter what. He is not incentivized at all to make a rash decision. Your gut, though, is if they win, he stays in Cleveland. My gut is he's staying in Cleveland if they Regardless. win or lose. I think Cleveland is a favorite versus the field. Not a heavy favorite, but a favorite versus the field. Yeah, I you think right now your gut don't matter. I think it's just in general, like it does not matter. What we've seen from LeBron, we are I, – I, I don't want to guess. Okay. All right? Yeah, so no fair. gut. It doesn't matter. I know LeBron. I know the way they're going about things. Things can change in six months. Yeah. You know, if they can't sign IT, what's the, why does LeBron stay there? I mean, why would it? If they don't if they don't do something with the Brooklyn pick with that asset, why should he stay there? The big baller brand extravaganza landed in Lithuania yesterday. A sentence in a million years I thought I'd never say. Lavar, Leangelo, and Lamella were met by a massive crowd at the Lithuanian airport. The ball boys are set to start playing for the Lithuanian team later this month. Uh, Nick, how crazy, how crazy is this whole I situation? I don't even – I listen, it's amazing video, and it's a – we've got to continue to, I guess, follow this story. But I don't know what to say. Like, these – I know that's a bad thing to do on television. I'm just being honest. Like, I don't – I don't know what to say. These the, – my opinion on LaMelo being pulled out of high school, Leangelo being pulled out of college, and these guys going halfway across the world to a small town in a smaller country – it hasn't changed. I think it. I think it is absolutely on the board that the absolute apex, the highlight of their entire time in Lithuania, was last night. <laughs> like was what was them arriving to a hero's welcome. I I wish the boys well, but I'm still very like nervous and anxious about how what their dads put the position their dads putting them in. How 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 those guys get their hair done in Lithuania? That's a great. question. You know, seriously. I mean, people are like, where I'm going to eat, where I'm going to live. It seems like he spends a lot of time on his hair. Not his dad. Because uh -huh. these are two kids that are drug to another world and going to have to try to learn basketball. And the dad continues. He doubled down with, oh, we're going to be here playing until all three of my boys are on the Lakers. Well... First of all, the youngest one is a junior. There is a rule in, in the, high if, school. Uh, and, and this is the thing. There's a rule that you have to be one year removed from your high school graduation. So he's a junior. His senior year is next year. And then there's another year before potentially this little kid, who's not going to be able to get his hair done over there, I don't think, before he potentially can join the Lakers. They have zero chance of yeah. playing for the Lakers. So let, let, then let me ask this question a little differently. You said you didn't really know what to say. What do you think we're talking about four months from now? They're four back months in the States. Now. Really? I 
back in the States in four months. Yeah. Well, they're certainly gone from Lithuania. Like, maybe, may, uh, I hope they play well. I hope they play well enough that a team not in the 10th-ranked European League can pick them up. <laughs> right. Not in the, in the by the way, the minor league of the 10th-ranked European League. Not even league. the good 10th ranked. And so, I, I, mean, I don't I, think they're good enough to play. I don't think they're good enough to be starters on the team. The Lithuanian team. Well, what other team are they going to play on? I mean, this is where they signed up. I don't believe that they're starters. When you look at even in the 10th league there, like there are talented basketball players everywhere. Now, they don't have the potential that yeah. these kids have, but potential is only good if cultivated and put on a stage. Right. This is not no stage for, for great athletes to train. So I feel bad for the kids because this is just the dad dragging the kids into these situations. That's All some right. big old earrings, Leanne. Look over your shoulder. Those are some rocks in Leangelo's ear. There's some rocks in the dad's head. <laughs> okay. right. Speaking of head-scratching things that have to do with basketball, LeBron and Kyrie's relationship. Reports are the Cavs attempted to trade Kyrie this offseason before Irving requested a trade of his own. If you will recall, the Celtics and Cavs swapped point guards in August. So, Nick... All that out there in the ether, does this story change your perception of Kyrie's exit from Cleveland in any way? No, it, it changes my perception on whether or not like people actually read news stories. <laughs> because there, the, the idea that the Kyrie was being shopped was out there for a long time. Yes. They, I mean, this was the, the, that to me wasn't the news in the story. But it's what everyone's talking about today. The news in the story to me was an exchange confirmed by Ty Lue and Kyrie Irving yes. at practice during last year. Of a style for which they were trying to play in Cleveland. I'm going to read this exchange that was confirmed by all parties. Tyron Lue said, Kai, I want you to play a little faster. Irving asked why. Tyron Lue said, because if we play faster, we get shots off easier. Kyrie replied, I don't need to play faster to get my shot off. I can do that any time. To which the coach, Tyron Lue, said, I'm not talking about your shot. I'm talking about RJ and JR, talking about his teammates. To which Kyrie Irving said, well, that's number 23's job. You then add to that a report in The Athletic earlier this year that Randy Mims, one of LeBron's closest friends, tried to dap up there you, that, Jenna, I tried to dap up. up Kyrie's father while they were still teammates. And Kyrie said he shouldn't be fraternizing with the enemy. The enemy. His team is best friend of one of his teammates. And then you hear the Cavs were trying to acquire Eric Bledsoe and Paul George. He got to go. Well, <laughs> if you're trying to beat the Warriors and you can get a point guard that's 75% as good as Kyrie and Eric Bledsoe and, and Paul George who can guard Kevin Durant, of course, of course you have those discussions. Like, CeCe, there's only five or six guys in the entire league that you do not entertain trade discussions with. Steph, Durant, LeBron, Giannis. With all due respect to Kyrie, he's not on that list. Like, I, I don't know why he would feel disrespected. Of course your name's going to come up in trade discussions. I think also you have to know the history of Kyrie. You, you brought a good point up. We knew there was fractions there in the Cleveland locker room even after they won the championship. Also, as far as was Kyrie a franchise player? Because before LeBron got there, all they did was lose. Now, Kyrie got his points, but all they did was lose. And he was not known as some great leader. It wasn't like he was embracing his teammates. And it was on the board when LeBron had decided he had kept it such a good secret. But once he said he was coming back to Cleveland, it was on board to trade Kyrie then. So this is not new news. You mentioned that. It wasn't. Um, I supported Kyrie in leaving because I knew they tried to trade him. I knew him and LeBron had some issues. So I'm glad Kyrie took control of his career. And he was able, he got lucky that he landed up in Boston compared to in Phoenix. Right. So for me, I supported him because I knew there was an undercurrent. I knew there was other things out there that people were, were kind of missing. And I believe at some point you have to take full control of your career and try right. to put yourself in the best situation that you can be successful. Well, uh, despite all of that, what you read, what you know, what you've heard, this is just business and basketball. Like, what what am I missing here? Yeah, you're right. You named the three or four guys that are probably untouchable, but th isn't this how it works? CC, you it's, always say that at the end of the day, it's still a business, and owners are going to do what they want to do, and players are going to do what they want to do. So Kyrie keeps bringing this? it up. Right. You've got to know. <laughs> Jenna, you, you make a great point. You've got to know who you are in this league. 
You know whose name gets bandied about in trade discussions? Anthony Davis. DeMarcus mm-hmm. Cousins. Yes. Clay Thompson. It's the way Isaiah it's the way the Thomas. Works. Like, of, of course this is going to happen. And Kyrie evidently was upset or offended that the Cavs would consider trading him in a trade that they weren't trading him for some future pick. It would be been for Eric Bledsoe and Paul George. But you can't, during practice, during the season, say, man, that, getting other people involved ain't my job. That's LeBron's job. And then be shocked that well, the offseason you know the they would entertain trading shocked, you. Nick, because they want Kyrie to be someone different. That's the reason why. What do you mean? They, they much rather blame it on LeBron and the Cavs compared to, oh, Kyrie participating in this. Oh, Kyrie, where there is some issues with Kyrie, not only before LeBron got there, but once LeBron was there. Kyrie knew that the Cleveland Cavaliers, even though he was the first pick for them of the draft, would never be his franchise. He realized that. Now, Kyrie is not a dumb guy, but sometimes you know more than what you understand. And him not understanding his overall hierarchy in the league and who LeBron is, I believe that that led to some type of confusion. Hold on. So wait, you just said something I find really interesting. You know more than you understand. Yeah, there's what a lot of people. And there's there's a lot of information. People who are learned people, they think that it's just in the details. But there's a thing called common sense. All right? And even after he made the shot, that would never be his franchise. Even before LeBron came back, it would always be LeBron's franchise. Even if LeBron had gone from Miami to some other team. And I think Kyrie and his team realized that. And in the end, don't you think Kyrie's happy with the way it turned out? Don't oh. you think ha- Kyrie's happy being the face of the team? So for, it, for, for for this to come out now, I think we ask the question, does it change your perception of Kyrie? I think it might be the other way around. If anything, for me at least... I feel like I've sided more with the Cavs in all of this. I, well, the, well, yeah, and the, the, the other thing is there, there is a faction of people that like to convince themselves that LeBron James is this puppet master behind the scenes. Yes. That in addition to NBA carrying... NBA office. Right. Yes. That, <laughs> that in addition to carrying the heaviest workload as a player, he also is the real coach because Ty Lue is not coaching. Oh, and yes, by yes. the way, he's the one calling up the Phoenix Suns and, and setting up trade talks. And the people's justification is, ah, look, you know, Eric Bledsoe, he's repped by Rich Paul. That's LeBron's guy. Well, so is Tristan Thompson. And the Cavs might trade Tristan Thompson away from the Cavs. LeBron, I am sure that if the Cavs had a trade in place, they would call LeBron and say, hey, this is what's going on. What, your thoughts on it before they pulled the trigger on a trade like this. But LeBron is not the one shopping Kyrie Irving. Mm-hmm. People want it to be, oh, LeBron and Kyrie didn't get along, so LeBron shopped Kyrie. That LeBron, And then remember the story this summer. LeBron's the one that leaked that Kyrie wanted out because, of course, it, sometimes – so, so, you know, the, the old Hitchcock thing of MacGuffin, sometimes a knife is just a knife. Sometimes a, a trade being leaked – It's just a trade being leaked. Like, it happens all through the league. Like, sometimes there's not some giant puppet master behind the scenes pulling all the strings. Hey, guys, it's Nick Wright. Thank you so much for listening to the First Things First podcast. But before the show moves along, I want to tell you about another great podcast available from Fox Sports. It's the Maybe I'm Crazy podcast with Joy Taylor. You know my friend Joy from Undisputed, but on Maybe I'm Crazy, she's breaking down the biggest stories in the world of sports in only a way Joy Taylor can. Does any other podcast beside Maybe I'm Crazy have loser power rankings? I don't think so. So check out the Maybe I'm Crazy podcast with my pal JT every week from Fox Sports. If the old adage is true, you're only as good as your last game, show, performance, whatever, nobody is more excited for the postseason to start than Cam Newton. He's coming off arguably his worst ever game last week, looking to rebound against the Saints. This weekend in the wild card round, while fans may be a bit nervous about which Cam they will see Sunday, Cam himself isn't. This is when the real football starts, you know, is explaining it to the young guys or the guys that haven't, you know, witnessed, you know, playoff football yet. This is this is where you, you, you're made or broke. And, um, you know, I look forward to these type of moments because it, 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 it brings out the best in the individual because it's so much um, pressure. And we all know what they say about pressure does one of two things. And, um, you know, we're hoping to shine like diamonds on Sunday. So, see, let's talk about Cam Newton's reputation, if you will, and whether or not a great game could change 
everyone's perception of him. Is that is that at all possible? How, how much would just the Panthers no. winning change it? Let's put it that no. way. One game, zero, zero chance of changing the perception. The way you think about Kim now is the way you'll think about him, whether they win or lose. Zero chance. Okay. In the wild card round? Yeah. I mean, Cam Newton's a superstar in this league. Like, we expect him to, to play well. So if he plays well, we're not going to be like, wow, this is something new. Like, Cam has been in six playoff games. He's got three wins. He's on a good football team. And if Cam doesn't play well, it's not going to change his perspective. Um, your perception of who he is as a quarterback. You know with Cam Newton on your team in Carolina, as long as Car um, is Cam's in Carolina, they will have a chance to win a Super Bowl. And you cannot change perception. Maybe Nick Foles can, but he's not playing the wild card game. Maybe Case Keenum can, because they don't have a resume in the playoffs. Right. But when you have been the MVP of the league, when you have led your team to the Super Bowl, there are not questions about Cam Newton. Wow, can he win a playoff game? No, he's already answered those questions. Wow, can he lead his team to the Super Bowl? Yes, Cam can do that. Well, what if he doesn't play well? Can he still get his team on the winning bus or winning plane? Yes, Cam can do that. So, no, not in the wild card round. I don't care if he throws the ball 80%, like no turnovers. It's not going to matter. You have to keep advancing. Cam is bigger than just the wild card round. And his, and his career is bigger than just a win in the, in the wild card round. He needs to be able to get his team to the Super Bowl and win the Super Bowl. Win the Super Bowl against Tom Brady, that would change the perception. It's a hell of a standard. It's a hell of a standard. That you asked me the question, didn't no, you? No, and I'm responding like, to it, CeCe. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a standard that he's not going to change perception in the wild card game when the guys played in six playoff games. He was the first pick in the draft. Mm -hmm. What kind of standard should we have? The, to be one of the better quarterbacks in the league, which is what I think he's been over the last seven years. Like the, the I, I agree with you that he's not going to change perception because people are entrenched on Cam. Like people are, people have b decided their opinions on him fairly or unfairly through these seven years of his career in one playoff game, good or bad. I don't think so. People that support Cam, he plays poorly. They're not going to jump off the bus. And people that don't think that think. I think we get caught up into this. Oh, I support a guy. I don't. I just report the news, all right? They make the news, okay. I report the news. So it's not a matter of do I support a guy. What I support is consistency, all right? If you're one of the best players and you have uh, the type of talent that Cam Newton has, like a lot of other players, if you're not playing to that level, then you're open for criticism. It's not a matter of do I support. I support the guys who are consistent. Okay, well, th let's talk about the consistency. Because I over the last, since he came into the league, Right, we want to, we'll even include his rookie year since 2011. I can think of five quarterbacks who have been consistently better than Cam: Brady, Rodgers, Breeze, Big Ben, Russell Wilson. That's it. That's the full list of guys to me that since Cam came in the league, I'd rather have. So if he's in that somewhere six to ten range, now Carson Wentz has probably jumped over him, but if we're talking about consistency, you probably need a bigger sample than that. Then I feel like he is he is scrutinized as if. He's in the 16 to 20 range because, as CC mentioned, his raw passing numbers are that of an average quarterback. But if, if his throwing numbers alone are an average quarterback and his rushing numbers are as the best rushing quarterback in the history of the league, then that puts him somewhere in that 6 to 10 range. And I just – I Do you think Cam is satisfied with his ability to pass the ball every game? No, oh. I don't. Okay. But, but the – but do you, how many guys in the league do you think are totally satisfied with where they are? Any person with the type of talent that Cam has, they would be more satisfied than he is. But the perception... So they'd be further along, you mean? They, they, yes, they absolutely. Would, okay, not necessarily satisfied with where he is right now. I mean, they'd be you're in along. year seven. I mean, it wasn't like he was a one-and-done guy. It came into the league when he was 19. Mm -hmm. He came in as a very mature person. At this point... It should be different. His fundamentals should be more buttoned up. It's not a matter of being a fan or criticizing the guy. If there was someone else had this kind of talent and they were not developing, I'll give you a prime example. Michael Vick, we criticize Michael Vick all the time for his lack of being able to throw the ball in the pocket consistently. We criticize Michael Vick a lot. Well, at least myself, objectively, CC, I did. But the but Vic, what Vick didn't have was – Multiple years of playoff success. What Vic didn't have was a league MVP. What Vic didn't have Michael was the Vic also didn't have the Carolina Panthers, the organization, and that defense around him. Okay, but he had better weapons on offense than who's the best receiver Cam's played with since Steve Smith, his second year. It I wouldn't mean, matter if he played with a Hall of Famer; he wouldn't hit him. 
Okay. okay. Well, <laughs> and that started, Nick, on the day at the combine. In shorts, wide receivers running patterns. Cam was one of the most inaccurate guys that we've ever seen at the combine. And there was no defenders. And the guys were running in T-shirts and shorts. So it's not like this is some new take on Cam Newton. His fundamentals are not good. And when you get in the game, his fundamentals break down. But I think that what, what is driving the perception is games like last week. He's not, when you talk about the guys in the, the net, not the top five guys, but the six to ten, mm -hmm. the six to twelve, those guys, maybe they're not insane, but maybe they're not atrocious. They bring it right. every single week. When you can show a graphic like we've been showing of Cam Newton, who plays superb, but superb, and then a horrible game like last week, I think that's what drives okay, that perception. Of course it does, Jenna, but you can't ignore the top side of the graphic. We, CeCe's mentioned that there's how many quarterbacks have had this many games of a sub-70 quarterback rating. It's a short list of bad quarterbacks and cams on it. But the flip side of that is there's only five guys in the league who have had games, five, four games or more with a 120-plus quarterback rating. And it's some of the best quarterbacks in the league. So you're right, Jenna. The guys in Cam's tier are usually consistently above average. As opposed to Cam, who is sometimes horrible and sometimes looks like Aaron Rodgers. Like, I just think we focus more on the former than the latter. That's So all. then answer the question. Can anything change everyone's perception? I think CeCe's right that the standard is yes, win the damn Super Bowl to change it. Welcome back to First Things First. Look who's here, Chris Canny. Hey, man. Braved see you, brother. the winter. I, I made it in. We're so happy you did. What is going on? This bomb cyclone. It's called a, <laughs> seriously, it's called a bomb cyclone. It is basically a winter hurricane. This is crazy. I know. It's crazy. That's but nonetheless, what it's we make called? it. Bomb, bomb, bomb cyclone. cyclone. Bomb cyclone. This is what's going on outside right now. And it's just starting. Cece, how long is this going to last? Oh, long time. <laughs> <laughs> long time. You're our weather expert. That's that long time? I thought well, I was getting some more I hope you went specific. to the grocery store. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is the kind of thing where there's like no water left on the shelf for days and no loaves of bread. <laughs> right. All right, people are carbo-loading. Uh, this time last year, the Rams season was over, and many were wondering if Jared Goff, the first overall pick, was also over. But in year two, Goff has burst onto the scene and is currently preparing for his first playoff game Saturday against the Atlanta Falcons. It is uh, really early in the West Coast. So he's probably not up and preparing right now, but he will be. Goff says he is ready for the challenge. Oh, I'll be nervous. I mean, I, 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 of course, yeah, you always get nervous, but I think it's more, more excitement and more anxiety, and, and you want to get out there than true nervousness. And, you know, you may have that little pit in your stomach at the beginning of the game, but it's no different than any other game for me, honestly. I feel that same way every week and i um, going to approach this one the same way. All right, so let's talk to, to, to all the people on this set here who played in a playoff game. So just sit wow. back there for a while. <laughs> so much shade. Wow. No, that so was much that shade. shade. Oh, a lot of shade. It's fine. It's How in the just, world was that shade, Chris? Get I was trying to hype you guys up. We were just going to move back just a little second. Just planted a palm tree behind Nick oh, right there. No, it's all good. Don't worry about it. I'm chilling. I take so I'm much. I'm chilling. I'm a tweet. Wow. I'm trying to just dish out. So uh, let's talk about that, that first playoff game. What's involved? The week leading up to it, the nerves, the different feel from a regular season game. How much is different now that the, the second season, really, if you will, started well here's the thing as a player you don't want to make it bigger than it already is you understand going into this situation the speed of the game is going to be different there's nothing you can do to prepare for it it's a single elimination tournament so everybody has that sense of urgency things are going to be a lot faster you're going to see some things some wrinkles from the opposing team that are not in the four game breakdown mm -hmm. so you've got to be able to adjust that's when experience comes into play from the coaching staff and then offensive and defensive play callers they're going to be more aggressive so as the player you have to focus on the fundamentals of your job. Eye discipline, hand placement, footwork, all of those things are factors. But again, you can't prepare for the environment. You can't prepare for the field. So you just have to go back to the fundamentals of the game. I can remember my first playoff game with the Dallas Cowboys in 2006. I felt like looking back on it, I had a little bit of an advantage because I had played in the preseason both in 2005, my rookie year, mm -hmm. and 2006. We played them in the regular season in Seattle. So I had seen that place three times before I went into wild card weekend. And I'm facing off against Walter Jones, Hall of Famer, and current Hall of Famer finalist Steve Hutchinson. And don't forget Sean Alexander coming off of an MVP season the year before. So this was and a big task. You set your career high in tackles that game. I did. I did. So this was a big task. But, again, I had seen the environment, and we focus on those fundamentals of those things. So you don't make it bigger than it already is. You always go back to the fundamentals of the game. So for the Los Angeles Rams and Jared Goff, yeah. you got to dance with the girl that brought you, which right. is Todd Gurley. And for my money, he's the MVP this season because of what he means to this team. Only Almost 2,100 yards from scrimmage, 19 touchdowns. 
That's their formula for success. So you don't want to put too much on Jared Goff in this situation. Sure. It has to go back to Todd Gurley in the running game. Yeah, it's a different season. Like, we can lie. Oh, yeah, you know something? It's the same. Like, if we were doing a show that was based on our ratings and we were going to be eliminated, <laughs> all right, tomorrow – you would do a different dang on show. Well, at least I hope you would. And that's the same way to play. Yeah, you're trying to repeat what you do 16 times, but in those circumstances, none of those circumstances for the most part are loser, go home. So you can't create the type of anxiety and the type of pressure that's in the playoff. The game is faster. There's three different levels of speed in the National Football League. It starts off with your baptism into the preseason. You're just trying to hold on. The game is moving faster than any football game you ever played in. And then you go to the regular season. Veteran players say, hey, big fella, you getting ready. They're getting ready to go 30 miles per hour faster than you've ever seen. You're like, how can that happen? <laughs> and you get in the regular season, the first game, you're like, whoa, man, this is fast. Yep. And then it's the granddaddy. It's the playoffs. They are moving 30 more percent faster than what you've seen in the regular season. The hits come on you quicker. Guys in space move a lot faster. And as wide receivers, what I used to always do to our room is I used to come up with a fine system. If you run out of bounds without being forced out of bounds, I would find you. If you dropped the ball, I would find you. If you dropped it on third down, I, the fine would be substantially more. And if you dropped a touchdown, I would ring your neck. <laughs> so how I went about it was a lot different because the stakes were different. I listened to Tom Brady. Tom Brady said, if you get in the playoffs, it's because you've been good. You deserve the right to play 70 plays. I'm trying to play great so that I earn the right to get 70 more plays. So, Jared Goff, nice try at your first press conference. This is where your name will be made. Legends are made in the playoffs, not in the regular season. I just want to follow up one quick thing with UCC. You mentioned your fine system, and you've told me about the very first one of that before in depth, about the running out of bounds thing. I think people understand, okay, you drop it, you're going to get fined. If you drop a touchdown, you ring your neck. Explain to the audience why the running out of bounds thing in the playoffs was a thing for you. Because of the physical presence. Not only also in the running game, we're going to block, but we're letting everyone on that team know we're not diva wide receivers. We're in it just like you guys. In the playoffs, everyone makes the same thing. There are no multi million. There is no twenty dollar, twenty million dollar quarterback in the playoff. You get the same paycheck that the fifty third guy on the roster gets. Your playoff portion. So let's show them we're not different. We're in the same boat. We're going to play physical, and it sends a message to the rest of the team. For, I got a question for you as well from your position. Mm -hmm. So I look at in this for in this game, not Jared Goff, but Aaron Donald, right? So Aaron Donald is one of the star players in this league. Uh, maybe anyone on the D line, but we'll talk about Donald. For a wide receiver, what you'd be worried about, I would think, is what happened with Odell last year. Like, you have your first pass of the game is dropped, you get in your own head, you try to do too much, and it builds on itself. With a D lineman, you might say, well, how, a D lineman is just going to work as hard as they can, so what bad can come of that? Would the concern be someone not sticking with their assignment, someone trying to, I want to make the star play as opposed to the Belichick thing, do your job. Is that the concern for a guy's first playoff game, that they're going to try to do too much from a defensive perspective, or does that not exist? No, it absolutely does exist because you get some guys that want to go out there and be the hero. And, CC, you talked about this yesterday on the show about guys doing things that are outside the norm of their yeah. routine. Mm -hmm. You stick to a routine. You want to be a creature of habit in the NFL because you want to have that formula for success you want yes. to be able to replicate that. If you yes. can't replicate that in, in the playoffs, then that's going to be a problem for you. So that's what you want to do. If you're one of those guys that gets on the early bus to get to the stadium three hours before kickoff, continue to do that. If you get on the late bus we get to the stadium two hours before kickoff, that's what you do. If you don't go outside to warm up, don't do that. Don't do that in the playoffs. Don't do something outside of the norm because your teammates are depending on you to be where you're supposed to be and execute the fundamentals of your assignment. If you don't do that, that's when the critical errors show up. It's all about being able to get back to the fundamentals of the game of football, which is run the ball, mm -hmm. stop the run, and rush the passer. And if you don't do those things at a high level, if you can't execute the fundamentals of football, you're going to have a hard time having success. That's what you worry about with a young team that doesn't have playoff experience. You it would seem to me that the one position where everything you described, which for people that don't know the difference between the regular season and the postseason, it's, it's really impressive how much faster the game goes. I mean, the way you described it was great. But the position where that would affect you the most might be the quarterback, who actually 
for the most part, dictates the pace of the game, how it's going to go and how it's going to move. You have a guy like Jared Goff going up against a guy like Matt Ryan, who at least has been there and done that. That's, that's a big differential in experience. How much is that going to play this? Into is the this? thing. He's not going against Matty Ice. He's going against Atlanta defense. He can't. He needs to do what the coaching staff has it in for him to do. He's got to spread the ball around. All right? Matty Ice, the reason why they're not as good as last year is because Julio Jones is getting his, but they're not spreading the ball around to the rest of the guys. If you get into an individual battle, if we were playing against San Francisco, I can't be worried about Jerry Rice, how many catches he got, how many touchdowns he got. I got a job to do, and you can't compete against the opposing quarterback. Jared Goff, don't worry about that. Do what Sean McVay has it in the game plan for you. And you mentioned, that's get that thing to Todd Gurley. Exactly. And if you want Jared Goff to be at his best, that's where it starts. Because if you look at the Rams offense this season, 1,599 yards passing on play action and screens. So Todd Gurley sets the table for everything yes. the Rams want to do on it's offense. It's important you do your job. In your biggest win ever, you had a different job than Michael Strahan. Yes. Right? But you need to do your job so that Michael can do – so you can put him in third and long so that Michael and the rest of those guys can rush the passer. It's important. That Belichick do your job thing, but doing it with the intense pressure and scrutiny that happens in the playoffs. One quick – I'm going to put you on the spot here. A quick question sure. if something comes to mind. That first playoff game you played in, Bill Parcells was your coach, correct? Yep. All right, so you, I know, CeCe, you almost got to play for Bill Parcells. You did get to play for Bill yeah, Parcells. Thank God I didn't. I wouldn't have been in the hall. But, <laughs> but, but you him. love him. Coach, you know I love you. Right. Okay. I have about 800 less receptions okay. fooling around with him. All right, but I, but I know that's a coach you have tremendous respect for. I, I know how much coach you love Parcells. Coach Parcells. Yes. What was his message to the team before that playoff game? Because that was a team without a lot of playoff experience, that Cowboys team. What was his message to the team, if you can remember? No, his message to the team was make sure that you trust your teammates and trust the call. Okay, don't when, when Mike Zimmer sends in the call defensively, you got to trust that call and do your job. So we were a stack two team, which means the defensive ends and the nose tackle, you were two gap players. You weren't necessarily going to get to the passer on a quick pass rush. Mm -hmm. You had to make sure that you stopped the run. So looking at that game, we held the Seattle Seahawks to less than 100 yards rushing, and they had over 30 attempts running the football. That was my assignment. Mm -hmm. That was my job. Now, unfortunately, we couldn't finish the drill because Tony Romo had the botched, right. uh, botched snap on the field goal. Up. Yeah, he couldn't get into the end zone. Jordan Babineau tracked him down. But we were in position to win that game. And that's one of the things that these players have to do. They got to trust Sean McVay and that coaching staff when they send in those calls, execute the fundamentals of that call and live in that moment. Don't think about the last play. Don't think about the next play. Think about the current play. Dear NFL, we got two more coming your way. We don't really know who will be better 10 years from now, but good luck figuring it out. Love, college. Both USC's Sam Darnold and UCLA's Josh Rosen will enter the 2018 NFL Draft. CC, both quarterbacks are projected to be top five picks. Which one will be a better pro? I got no clue. <laughs> got no clue. I mean, we got two kids in college. Besides their measurables, their throwing motion, like, what do we know uh, about them? And... We know zero about them, what they'll do in, in, in the pro game. Now, I do like that conventionally they come from conventional college offenses compared to Baker Mayfield. Um, I think Baker Mayfield and Josh Allen, depending on where they are, uh, the kid from Wyoming, they have a chance to be just as good as Sam Darnold or Josh Rosen. We need to see where they go first. I can't answer this question. Until I see which teams they go to, see the direction of the team, because you're talking about, I talk about 99% of all NFL players need a great system to cultivate their talent. Now, you think that these kids don't need a system? They really do. And where they go will determine the arc and the destiny as far as their career and how we look at them as NFL quarterbacks. Well, there's one team that's going to have to decide who of these two they like more is the Cleveland Browns at number one. Assuming they're going to draft a quarterback, I would think they would. I, Sashi Brown, I think, got fired because he didn't draft a quarterback in the first round. Go ahead, CeCe. Look yeah, like they're going to draft a quarterback, but we can't be just consumed that someone doesn't come up the charts and slide in front of Josh Rosen or Sam Donald. Or Sam Darnold, which I believe Josh Allen, if someone's going to take a flyer, he could be the guy as we go through these next five months 
of trying to tear these guys' games apart, Josh Allen might be have the biggest upside, and someone might decide to reach for him ahead of these other two. Listen, you're totally right that we could a guy could based come out on of nowhere. My, based on the source. Based on the source. Well, and how about this? Based on recent history. People didn't see Mitch Trubisky being the first quarterback taken at this point, point. last season. Like mm-hmm. th- that is not what people people were people held. People didn't see Pat Mahomes going before Deshaun Watson. Like things weird things happen. Carson in, Wentz. It, they weren't high on him. North Dakota <laughs> State guy, similar. Not North Dakota State, smaller than Wyoming as far as schools. But another yes. guy people didn't know a lot a lot about. People were much more focused on Jared Goff, who I guess did go ahead of him. But I, if I were the Browns and it was between these two guys, which I think at least as of now it most likely will be, I am a Josh Rosen fan. Now, I will admit, I, I don't think there's anybody that is great at saying this college player's at quarterback going to be awesome. This guy's not. If, he were, if they were, he would be running an NFL team, and I don't see an NFL team that consistently mm-hmm. gets this one right. We, we give all this respect to the Patriots. Look, man, they, <laughs> yeah. they, they, they got Brady. Well, yeah, after they passed on him five times, they got Jimmy Garoppolo. Yeah, that's true. After they also drafted Ryan Mallett, they drafted Matt, they drafted a bunch of guys that they missed on. The reason I like Rosen, though, just to be quick, is I've seen Rosen improve each year of his collegiate career. Darnold was at his best seemingly last year, and this year got worse, and at least statistically, every category. He had lower completion percentage, fewer touchdowns, more interceptions. So even if, like, Rosen's overall body of work might be slightly more, I'm sorry, Darnold's overall body of work might be slightly more impressive than Rosen's, I see Rosen on the uptick and Darnold not not the same trajectory. So if I were to have to choose between the two, I'm a Josh Rosen guy. So you know uh, far more in, in, you know, you drive in the lane of the numbers, and you obviously know more about raw talent from watching these two guys. And from everything I've read and watched from these two guys in college, the, the third intangible would be, you know, where your heart is and, and who you are as a person. And, and it looks like, from what we've learned and read about these guys from college, that Sam Darnold is one of those, like, eat, breathe, live, my soul's on fire for football, I'm first one here, I'm last one to leave I need football I want to be around football this is my passion and and Rosen it, it's not as important to him in his life he has outside interests he's very outspoken not that it has nothing to do with football but it just seems like if, if you want to win one game it seems like Josh Rosen would be your guy but if you want someone for the long haul it has Sam Darnold has the feel of being that kind of guy that would be first there last last to leave just from based yeah. on what they did in college yeah I don't think it'd be fair for us to draw that conclusion um Because Josh Rosen, he's made some comments that he might be interested in more things. That doesn't mean that another player is more committed because one guy is woke up socially and is trying to make a difference in different areas. That just means he's well-rounded, you know, and and that could be a plus when you look at it. I I haven't seen anything or heard anything around these kids that one of these guys loves football more so I would wouldn't want to go down that road what I'm concerned about is both of these kids are California kids right mm-hmm. they didn't grow up in the Midwest right they didn't grow up in the north they didn't grow up in the northeast right correct you don't know if you go to Cleveland you see how it is outside today you're going to play a lot of games in it. Now, if y'all can tell me that either one of these guys could go outside on 6th Avenue and throw a football <laughs> because that's what it's going to be like in Cleveland. The CC, as always, focused, I think, rightfully on the weather, something I'm never thinking about in this analysis, but it's a good point. By I mean, it's a great point, especially when we see the, di- the way, different way guys They're play. They're California kids. Right. No, it, I mean, when we hear it. It's proven. Absolutely. In cold weather. Everything shrinks. So, if you got a small hand, I don't know the hand size. <laughs> but everything. That's not no hot take. Okay. All right? But, but if you have a smaller hand and you cannot grip the football, the reason why Aaron Rodgers is great and Brett Favre, we're great in Green Bay, their hand size and their grip pressure on the football. Now, if they had, they're one of the rare people that could play in Green Bay. So I don't think either one of these kids right now we have anything that say they can do that. I just real quick to respond to your thing about Rosen because whether it's fair or not, what Jenna said is what you are already reading from these anonymous scouts, these people that are so yeah, – to te- these anonymous scouts <laughs> that say, that say uh, you know, Josh Rosen, he, he's been in football to make money. That was one of the knocks on him recently. Some of these guys. I think Josh Rosen comes from some money. He comes from a lot of money. Okay. His his (laughs) dad was in line to be Surgeon General under President Obama, if I (laughs) if I have it correct. I some of these guys will knock Rosen for that. 
I think it's wildly unfair. I think it's ridiculous. I think the idea that because someone wants to be well-rounded, wants to be thoughtful on things, that it's going to knock them as a football guy, I think is absurd. But for some teams, it absolutely will knock him. I'm Jenna Wolf, and thank you for listening to the First Things First podcast. Make sure to subscribe and tell your friends, family, and coworkers about the podcast, which, by the way, is available on iTunes and all your favorite podcast apps. You can catch a fresh new episode every Monday through Friday on FS1, starting at 6.30 a.m. Eastern, 3.30 a.m. Pacific. So long, everyone. <laughs>